Legend of Zelda is one of the most iconic series in all of gaming, and also happens to be my personal favorite. I've set out to rank every main series game and compile the ultimate Zelda series ranking. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the first Zelda game for the Nintendo DS, The Legend of Zelda Phantom Hourglass. For each game, we're going to be scoring it across 10 categories. Story and characters, world, graphics and art style, gameplay, items, dungeons, bosses and enemies, side content, pacing and game flow, and finally, music. Each category will be scored from 1 to 5, with 5 being the best. Please note that these scores are going to be somewhat relative in comparison to the other Zelda games, so just keep that in mind. At the end, we will average all the scores and come up with an official score for the game. Shout out to the Zelda Dungeon crew for the heavy inspiration for this scoring system. Now let's get started, and potential spoilers ahead for this game and these other Zelda titles. The story takes place immediately after The Wind Waker. Ganon has been defeated, and now Link and Tetra have set sail on the Great Sea to find a new land to call their own. During their travels, they come upon the ghost ship. Tetra hops aboard, and trouble occurs. Link attempts to save her but fails and washes ashore on a mysterious island, where he meets Oceus, who is later revealed to be the Ocean King. To find the ghost ship, Link must first find the spirits of wisdom, power, and courage, with the help of his fairy companion Celia and a boat captain named Lineback. Upon finding the ghost ship, they learn about the mysterious evil that is known as Bellum. The only way to defeat him and to revive Tetra from her frozen state is to craft the Phantom Sword. Link sets out to find the three metals needed to craft the Phantom Sword, all while intermittently making his way further and further through the Temple of the Ocean King. Once the Phantom Sword is finally crafted, Link makes his way to the very bottom of the Temple of the Ocean King and defeats Bellum in a truly epic encounter. The Ocean King regains his full power, and Tetra is then revived to her normal state. It's then revealed that the entire story has taken place in the world of the Ocean King, and Link and Tetra return to the normal world, and they learn that only 10 minutes have passed during their entire journey. And in the distance, we see Lineback's ship sailing off. The story is pretty good and impressively cinematic for a DS game. The thing that hurts the story overall is its similar ending to Link's Awakening. Though the world of the Ocean King may not necessarily be a dream like it was in Link's Awakening, it's hard not to compare the two, especially with the Ocean King being a whale much like the Windfish was a whale in Link's Awakening. The one hope that it wasn't a dream, of course, is seeing Lineback's ship at the end sailing off into the distance. The story also doesn't do too much to expand the lore or the impact overall of the Legend of Zelda world. I'm not saying every game needs Ganon, the Master Sword, or the Triforce, but when you have these alternate worlds, it's hard to determine if anything you see in this game is something that could exist elsewhere in Hyrule. In terms of characters, Lineback steals the show. The cowardly and selfish sea captain is a fun character to team up with throughout the game, and is the only character that sees any semblance of an arc throughout the game. Granted, it's not as fleshed out as, say, Groose and Skyward Sword, but it definitely feels earned to see him muster the courage to take on Bellum and put aside his selfishness at the end. Other than that, there's no truly standout characters. The Ocean King and Celia can be fun at times, but nothing that stands out in the Zelda series. I do also appreciate the sprinkles of really funny moments in the game that help some of these characters come to life. On the villain side, let's talk about Bellum. Well, I mean, what is there even really to talk about? We get a brief explanation halfway through the game that's kind of it. I'm not saying we need this truly deep and conflicted villain in a Zelda series, but Bellum has to be one of the most underdeveloped and disappointing Zelda villains of all time. Bellum is never seen until the very end and just ends up being the most uninspired eyeball monster that we have seen a hundred times in other Zelda games. If he was going to look so generic, I wish they would have at least added more to his character. So for the story in Phantom Hourglass, I will rate it a 2 out of 5. There are some great moments and Lineback is one of the most memorable Zelda characters, but the story is ultimately just a tad too derivative of Link's Awakening, and Bellum is just straight up the worst Zelda villain we have seen thus far. The world 
world in Phantom Hourglass is known as the World of the Ocean King. Clearly, the idea was to replicate the Great Sea from Wind Waker, but translate it into a handheld console. And honestly, I think the developers did a really good job. The World of the Ocean King is split into four quadrants, which you unlock through your playthrough. Having the whole map not immediately open all at once makes the world feel bigger since it makes you feel like there's still a lot to explore. The islands you visit through your playthrough all look unique, the ones which include towns feel somewhat lively. Exploring and searching for treasure can be a lot of fun, and I think I actually prefer finding treasure in this game compared to The Wind Waker. To discuss some of the negatives, the world just isn't very memorable. It had been quite a few years since I had gone and replayed the game, so right before starting my playthrough, I found myself only being able to recall maybe one or two islands that you visited. Other Zelda game worlds which I've gone longer since playing still stick very vividly in my mind. While I did mention every island does feel different, some islands, particularly some with dungeons, are just straight up bland. For the world, I'm going to rate it a 3 out of 5. I think it's an impressive translation of a Wind Waker style world that encourages treasure hunting and is relatively large. However, it is held back by some islands on the more boring side and just not being quite as memorable as some of the other worlds in Zelda games. The graphics and art style of Phantom Hourglass, I'd say, are pretty decent. Being the sequel to Wind Waker, I can understand why they would use the same art style, but it does also keep the game from having its own identity. Again, I understand why they did it, and it totally makes sense, just pointing out that it does make it feel less unique. Especially being that due to the limitations of the DS, it is just a worse looking version of Wind Waker graphics. The graphics really stand out in a bad way when they do a lot of zoom ins on doors and during some cutscenes. You can really see how low res some of the textures on the walls look. Don't get me wrong, I appreciate how ambitious they were trying to make a handheld Zelda more cinematic and feel more like a 3D Zelda, but you can't help but notice how pixelated some things can really look up close. I'm going to rate the graphics and art style a 2 out of 5. I appreciate the ambitious attempt to translate GameCube graphics to a Nintendo DS and trying to make a more cinematic experience, but it is held back by looking like a clearly inferior version graphically and the game likes to remind you of it with many close-up shots and low-res textures. The Zelda team decided to go ambitious when it comes to gameplay. Deciding to fully utilize the touchscreen capabilities, Link is controlled by using just your stylus. This ultimately ends up sometimes being the best and worst parts of the game. First, looking at the positives. Moving with Link and sword combat is really fluid and works a lot better than you would expect. It feels very natural to move the stylus where you want Link to go and motioning your stylus in the direction you want to slash your sword. Controlling the boat also works great, you simply draw the direction you want the boat to go, and this frees you up to control the cannon while the ship moves along, in case you run into any obstacles or enemy ships. The Zelda team also did a great job of making puzzles unique to the DS. Many puzzles involve writing a note on your map or drawing a specific design to open a door. Lots of these puzzles would be a little too cumbersome to input into a Zelda game where you weren't able to take notes. This definitely helps separate the game from the pack. Now for the negatives. While the sword combat is great, using items in combat can be downright awful. When you select items to use like the boomerang or the bow in combat, you are just a sitting duck waiting to get hit. Drawing a line for your boomerang with bubbles flying all around, it can be really frustrating to aim properly. Finally, we get to the microphone. The Zelda team really, really wanted to fully utilize the DS, and did they ever? because the DS had a microphone they felt obligated to apparently make use of. This could involve blowing out a flame by blowing into the mic, or even yelling to get a discount on an item. Why? Just why? This is meant to be a portable game, you can't just be yelling or blowing on a DS when you're on the train or a bus or something. I always felt like the biggest idiot anytime I had to use the microphone. I legitimately had to tell my girlfriend ahead of time that it was going to look stupid, or that I was going to yell just so she wasn't thinking that I was about to have a stroke or something. I'm going to give the gameplay and combat a 3 out of 5. I appreciate the unique touchscreen controls when it comes to Link's movement and combat, 
Mapping your route with the boat is great and frees you up to use the cannon, and the puzzles are built to really utilize the touchscreen and taking specific notes. However, this category is definitely held back by frustrating item use during high-stress combat situations and forcing players to use the microphone and feel like a complete idiot. When it comes to items in Phantom Hourglass, it was more of how they were used instead of originality. For items, we have the boomerang, bombs, bomb chews, the hammer, the grappling hook, the bow, and the shovel. All of these items have been featured in previous Zelda games. However, none of them have been utilized quite like they have been in Phantom Hourglass. The touch controls allowed for a unique use of a lot of the items, except for maybe the bombs and the shovel, as there was nothing too innovative going on there. The boomerang and the bomb chews both utilize touch controls in a nice way, allowing you to draw a path that you would like them to go in. This was really great for solving puzzles, but as previously stated, it did suffer really badly in combat situations. The bombs and the hammer also felt pretty good to aim with the touchscreen. I appreciate the extra leeway they gave to the hammer in terms of distance, since it would be really lame if it had the same short range as A Link to the Past. The standout item in my opinion is the grappling hook. They took a signature item from the Wind Waker and got pretty creative with it. It can work like a hook shot in certain situations, then you can create a tightrope and walk between the gap, you can bounce off the rope to jump over large gaps, you can even shoot arrows to bounce it off the rope and hit special targets. It seems like all the creative juices went into this item. I'm rating the items a 3 out of 5. No item is really original and new to the series, but they put a fun spin on a number of them. The grappling hook is definitely the key standout. Pretty much every item aside from the hammer really suffers in combat situations, which ultimately brings the score down a bit. Phantom Hourglass has six traditional dungeons. The Temple of Fire, the Temple of Wind, the Temple of Courage, the Goron Temple, the Temple of Ice, and finally Muta's Temple. This is supported by a mini dungeon in the ghost ship and of course the infamous Temple of the Ocean King. I would say overall the traditional dungeons all kind of blend together with nothing really standing out too much. Though the aesthetics vary between them, they do mostly feel the same. The one standout exception in my opinion is the Temple of Ice. Obviously the ice theme itself makes it feel different, but also housing the best item in the game with the most creative uses made the dungeon really stand out and feel very clever. The ghost ship as a mini dungeon I also thought was quite creative and definitely is my second favorite dungeon in the game. Now of course it's time to talk about the big phantom in the room if I should say. The Temple of the Ocean King. When you ask a Zelda fan about Phantom Hourglass, this is usually the first thing they mention if they're talking anything negative about this game. I can definitely understand it. Before I ever played this game for the first time, I knew what I was in for with this temple, so I was able to mentally prepare myself for it. I can totally see anyone coming into this game cold, not knowing they would have to revisit and replay multiple sections of the same dungeon over and over with a time limit and being unable to kill certain enemies and having to be somewhat stealthy, I might grow to dislike the game too. The first time around playing this game, I definitely found myself dreading going back to the Temple of the Ocean King. On my most recent playthrough, I have to say it's not that bad. Sure, I'll be honest and say I don't love it, but your first few trips through the temple really aren't that bad. Once you hit the checkpoint midway, I definitely get how it starts to be more annoying. I still admire the Zelda team for trying something different, and it is a legit intense and difficult experience, which was quite rare in this era for Zelda games. And who can't deny that through all the torture of this temple that it didn't feel amazing to go through that temple at the end with the Phantom Sword and be able to finally start slaying all those phantoms. I'm going to rate the dungeons in Phantom Hourglass a 2 out of 5. Most of the traditional dungeons aren't too impressive and as much as I want to credit the Temple of the Ocean King for its boldness, I can't deny that it can still be quite annoying and frustrating. The Temple of Ice and the Ghost Ship are definite winners though. Most of the standard enemies are exactly what you would expect from a Zelda game. You have your chews, your bubbles, and your keys. 
Fittingly, there are a number of reappearances from The Wind Waker. The interesting new additions are the phantoms which you see in the Temple of the Ocean King. I have to say they really made these guys matter and made them feel really intimidating. There was real consequences from taking a hit from one of these guys, you'd both lose health and lose time during the dungeon. These guys really made sure you could not get careless without regretting it. The bosses in Phantom Hourglass are a definite positive. So looking at the first boss, Blaz, I think that's how you say it, I was initially going to really crap all over this one. In actuality, I'm just an idiot. Apparently I thought you had to use the microphone against this boss to blow out his flame, and it honestly seemed like it worked at times, but I just happened to do the other mechanic right. But I, obviously I was really frustrated when initially fighting him. The actual way to beat him is to look at the top screen with, and use your boomerang to take out the three copies in the correct order based on the number of horns that they have. Now knowing that the microphone isn't needed, I'll say this boss is not too bad. Not the most clever use of the DS, but hey, it did stump me. Cyclock, the second boss, is one of the major highlights. The use of two screens was done really well here, and it felt very natural to time your bombs into the updrafts to blow them up. This was really one of my favorite bosses. Crake was really frustrating, again using the two screens here, but one of them is from the perspective of the boss himself. It was very disorienting to try and spin and snipe him with your bow, but still an interesting concept. It was not very obvious to me that you had to hit these stupid purple things on his sides, so I ended up shooting him with a bow over and over again wondering what the heck I was doing wrong. The Cuba sisters bring back good old Zelda tennis style vibes that we've seen many times. It's a classic for a reason, because it's fun. Not the most original concept, but for the use of two screens and having three of them, I thought it was nice. Dongo Rongo is pretty cool, you get to control Link and your Goron buddy in the first phase, then you have the more traditional Dodongo style fight in phase 2. Gliok is also a really cool fight which is somewhat reminiscent of Trinex from A Link to the Past with the fire and ice heads. Again the grappling hook is used really nicely in this fight, you have to properly angle the grappling hook to bounce back the correct energy blast back at the opposite dragon. The second phase has you grappling their tongues to pull them in for some sword slashes. The ice temple really just gets everything right in this game. Eox isn't the most creative or original fight, but boy is it fun. Zelda pulls the Shadow of the Colossus and has you take on this giant dude. Launch yourself in the air and smash away at all of his weak spots. Finally, we have Bellum. I acknowledge that as a character, Bellum sucks, but I think the actual boss fight here is really cool. We have multiple phases to work with. Starting out in a two room floor at the bottom of the Temple of the Ocean King, first you use your grappling hook to hook away at his purple clouds and smash his eye. You move up to the second floor to use your bow having to find the right angle and timing to hit each of the eyes. Eventually you have to use a time stopping mechanic to hit the big eye at the right time. After a brief cutscene, you move into a boat phase against a corrupted ghost ship. This phase is pretty easy, but it is a nice incorporation, considering the importance of the boat in this game. Then finally, poor old Lineback is corrupted by Bellum, leading to an epic standoff against him in phantom form. This was a pretty challenging phase that took me multiple tries, and I appreciate the game showing me mercy by allowing you to continue specifically from this part of the battle if you die. Overall, you basically are looking at an impressive five-phase standoff against Bellum to conclude the main quest. I'm going to give the enemies and bosses a 4 out of 5. While the standard enemies are mostly Wind Waker repeats, we do have some new inclusions including the phantoms, and the boss fights are all mostly good and creative. There's only a couple duds here. Phantom Hourglass has a fair amount of side content. There's plenty of power gems to collect, which I think the game does a poor job of telling you what their actual function is. They have a few mini games as well, including Maze Island to explore. There's plenty of treasure hunting to be done, and I like the added depth to getting treasure with the mini game that they included. I think it makes it more fun than the treasure hunting that was in The Wind Waker. Treasures can vary from ship parts to hourglass sands. The sands will add time to your trips through the Temple of the Ocean King, which is a pretty nice reward to give you a little bit more breathing room, though the extra time is not at all necessary to complete the temple. There's a trading sequence you can take part in, but I skipped since the one in Link's Awakening is enough for one lifetime for me. The ship parts in my opinion are a bit of a lost opportunity. 
You can put together the right combinations to get extra health on your boat, but I feel like they could have done so much more. It would have been nice for each piece to provide some sort of functional benefit. Why not parts that make your ship go a little bit faster, or ones that can make your cannon fire better or add more power to your cannon? Ones that could add more durability to your salvage arm? There's plenty of things they could have done, and it's a little disappointing to see that not much was done here. And most of these combinations you may not even get until you've already beaten the game, so it doesn't really matter too much. I'm going to give the side content here a 3 out of 5. There's a good amount of things to collect if you're really trying to stretch the game. The hourglass sands are a really nice reward, but there's definitely some missed opportunities. For me, music is a really important part of my Zelda experience. The first thing that hooked me about this series was way back when I was a kid, watching my friend play A Link to the Past and hearing that epic Hyrule Castle music. Does Phantom Hourglass live up to the rest of the series when it comes to epic and catchy tunes? No, not even close. Don't get me wrong, there's some good tunes here. Linebeck's theme is amazing, Osha's theme I also really like. The theme where you're sailing is also a nice version of the Great Sea theme from Wind Waker, and of course we get a few returning tracks from Wind Waker. The problem comes from what you hear the vast majority of the game. When you explore an island, you hear this. When you're in a cave, you hear this. When you're in a dungeon, you hear this. These have got to be some of the most boring and bland tracks in any game. I'm going to give the music a 1 out of 5. Sure we get a few nice tracks, but what you hear for 90% of the game is really bland and not up to the Zelda standards we have come to know. Pacing and gameflow is really just about how the main quest moves along. Do we have parts that drag on? Do we go too long without entering a dungeon? And other aspects of a similar nature. For Phantom Hourglass, I think the pacing is honestly really good. It feels like you're moving dungeon to dungeon pretty quickly without an overabundance of padding in between. The only part that drags a little bit is getting to dungeon 2, but it really isn't too bad. Certain sections like before Muta's Temple has quite a few things to do, but I think it flowed pretty nicely. I'm going to give the pacing a 4 out of 5. The main quest moves along nicely, with only a few hiccups along the way. Love it or hate it, the Temple of the Ocean King's inclusion means you're never going to go too long without hitting your next dungeon experience. Overall, really solid pacing. So we've gone through each category and let's recap real quick. Story and characters was given a 3. The world was given a 3. Graphics and art style, 2. Gameplay, 3. Items, 3. Dungeons, 2. Bosses, 4. Side content, 3. Music, 1. And finally, pacing, 4. Averaged out, that gives The Legend of Zelda Phantom Hourglass a 2.8 out of 5. This is the first of a multi-part series where we will go through each main Zelda game to determine the ultimate series ranking. I'll be going through each game in no particular order, Basically, I will just go to whichever one I feel like playing next. Make sure to let me know how you would rate Phantom Hourglass in each category and overall in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you again sometime in the not-too-distant future.